Hi, I'm Jeremy, the Zoo Nerd, coming to you live from my backyard in Los Angeles, California. How's everybody doing today? I hope you're well. I hope you're happy, healthy, having some fun. I hope you're staying safe as uh, numbers of coronavirus cases in many states across the United States are going up. Uh, remember how we handled this in the beginning. Stayed home, stay safe, wear a mask when you have to go out, stay six feet apart from others. Those are proven methods, they work, it's science. I am a believer in science because science is truth. So stay safe. Today in our Critter Chat, we're gonna talk about an amazing little species or actually a very large family of species. Uh, today we're talking about hummingbirds. Now this week is also pollinator week. Um, we talked about the most significant pollinator a couple weeks ago in Critter Chat when we talked about bees. Bees are by far the most important of all pollinators because they pollinate most of the food that we eat. Um, but there are some other pollinators as well. Hummingbirds are one of those. Hummingbirds typically pollinate flowers of plants that we don't eat. Uh, things like what's right here by me. These are agapanthas uh, or lily of the uh, Nile and they are very beautiful flowers that I am lucky to have in my yard, uh, but they occasionally see hummingbirds on them. Um, typically the hummingbirds that come to these flowers are here early in the morning or late in the afternoon. Um, they're not so active during the heat of the day, which today is 90 degrees at my house. So uh, hummingbirds are usually kind of taking it a little easier right now. I don't typically see them this time of day. With hummingbirds, there are a lot of hummingbirds. Um, I saw numbers of 328, I saw 340, I saw 350 species. Um, we're gonna go with the th around 340. Um, with science and uh, with species identification, that's usually up for debate. So we're gonna play the middle ground and go for like the 340 species of hummingbirds. Hummingbirds are almost exclusively uh, New World animals. So they live in the Americas, um, with many of them living in the tropics. Uh, South America, Central America have way more hummingbirds than Northern America. Um, the largest of hummingbirds is a species that lives in South America near the Andes Mountains called the giant hummingbird. It is about eight and a half inches long. Um, so that's pretty big for a hummingbird. Uh, the smallest is called the bee hummingbird. Um, the bee hummingbird is only two inches long for a male. Um, males are slightly smaller in that species and they live in Cuba. Uh, when we talk about weight of hummingbirds, um, the bee hummingbird, the littlest one, weighs half as much as that, half as much as a nickel. So uh, get a nickel, hold it. A bee hummingbird weighs half as much as that. So you could have two hummingbirds on your hand for that much weight. Uh, they are absolutely tiny um, birds. So they have a skeleton, they have bones, they have feathers. Um, most hummingbirds weigh about um, four grams. So they're about the weight of a nickel um, or a little bit heavier than the weight of a nickel. So pretty light weight. Hummingbirds live in a wide variety of habitats. They live in deserts, they live in mountains, they live in plains, they live in forests. But like I mentioned, most of them live in the tropics or for at least part of the year live in the tropics. Many hum hummingbirds are migratory and uh, move depending on the time of year. Their long slender bills are specially adapted to collect the nectar from flowers. All hummingbirds eat the nectar of flowers um, and they also eat some other things. We'll get into that in a minute. But they have a very long tongue that is actually split and that helps them to collect the nectar or the sweet juices inside the flowers. Uh, flowers that are trying, plants that are trying to attract hummingbirds typically have bright colored flowers, uh, reds, oranges, sometimes purples and they usually contain nectar, which is um, that sugary sweet uh, juice 
that's kind of inside the flower. Most uh, flowers that attract hummingbirds are also longer shaped. So they're kind of like a trumpet shape um, where the hummingbird has to really put its bill into the flower to collect the nectar. They also eat a lot of insects. Uh, the insects hummingbirds go after are usually the little tiny guys, things like fruit flies, gnats. Uh, they'll eat the eggs of certain insects that they may find up in the trees. Um, they'll also eat spiders and the eggs of spiders. Um, spiders are very important to hummingbirds. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute too. It's estimated that a hummingbird has to eat every 15 minutes when it's awake. Um, so um, they are eating a lot during the day, going from flower to flower to flower to flower to flower to flower. Uh, some people that were studying hummingbirds documented a single hummingbird visiting 20 flowers in one minute. So they uh, definitely move around quite a bit. It's estimated that they also eat about uh, half of their weight per day. Um, for them, they're a little tiny, so that's a very light weight still. But if we thought about how much food that would be if you took your weight and divided it in half, uh, that's a significant amount of food. To conserve energy, because they're always on the go, they beat their wings really fast, they have a super high uh, heartbeat when they're flying. Um, when they're resting, when they sleep at night, um, they actually go into uh, something that scientists call torpor. Torpor is almost like a mini hib hibernation. Uh, they significantly lower their blood, uh, sorry, their heartbeat. They lower their breathing. Uh, they lower their body temperature. Um, in some species, their body temperature is up around 105 when they're active. And at night or during colder seasons, they can lower that down to 65 degrees. Um, so they definitely cool off a lot. They almost become like in a trance-like state. Um, very, very deep sleep. And that helps them to conserve energy. Also, if you've ever looked at a hummingbird, their feathers are a little tiny. Their feathers don't insulate them very well. Um, so it's hard for them to maintain that um, high body temperature when it's cooler at night. And so that allows them to use less calories uh, to maintain that. They are masters of flight. Um, they can typically beat their wings 70 times Per second um, but when they're diving when they're moving really fast and you may have seen this uh, they actually are beating their wings 200 times per second um, with that they are capable of they have a different muscle system than most birds most birds their muscles for their wings are kind of on their chest and really kind of help the birds move their wings down um, that's kind of where most of the muscle movement happens as the bird beats its wings down. With hummingbirds, they have an extra set of muscles attached to their wings that are on their back. That helps them move their wings up. And with that, they're able to move their wings super, super fast. In addition to up and down, they can also move their wings in a figure eight motion. This is how they are able to hover or stay kind of in one place while beating their wings. They're really the only animal with bones that is capable of doing that. Um, and that helps them a lot when they're feeding on the flowers. They can also move pretty quick. So the typical speed of hummingbird is like 30 to 45 miles per hour. But there's one species called the green violet eared hummingbird uh, that's been clocked at 93 miles an hour, uh, super fast. Uh, for anyone, but especially a little tiny bird flying that fast is uh, really remarkable. In addition to being able to hover in front of flowers when they're eating, they can also move backwards. They're the only bird that can fly backwards and they can fly upside down. Now, if you've ever seen hummingbirds fighting with each other, um, that's when you will most likely see some of these strong uh, tactical maneuvers, upside down, backwards, those kind of things. Um, if you are lucky enough to have hummingbirds around where you live, 
take a moment and watch them and you'll see some of this crazy flying that they're capable of. I mentioned earlier that many of them migrate throughout the year, so they're always on the search for where the good flowers are that they can get the nectar. Um, so that makes them kind of seasonal visitors or residents in different places. Um, here in Southern California, where I live, uh, we actually have three species that can be found um, quite often. Anna's hummingbirds, Rufus hummingbirds, and Allen's hummingbirds are all fairly common in Southern California year round with Anna's hummingbirds for sure living here year round. Um, that's because Southern California has a very nice mild temperate climate. We usually have something blooming at any time of the year so there's always flowers for them to eat. In other places they will follow flowers further north as the flowers uh, bloom in like the springtime. Um, with the middle of summer being up high elevations in the mountains in the northern hemisphere in North America and uh, following those flowers up the mountain as they uh, bloom, being at very high elevations this time of year in June, July. Some of their migrations are pretty amazing. Uh, the ruby-throated hummingbirds, which are the most common species seen in the eastern United States, uh, especially east of the Mississippi, they're the only species that nests east of the Mississippi in the U.S. Um, but during the winter time, they fly down to Mexico and Central America. Um, and they are there for a couple of months during the cold time of the year for the rest of us. And then they fly back north uh, in the springtime. To do so, they cross the Gulf of Mexico, which is a pretty big body of water when you're a little tiny bird. They're capable of making that journey across the Gulf of Mexico in a 20 hour time frame. Um, they'll stock up on nutrients before they go across that, um, gaining a lot of weight. And by the time they reach the other side, they have lost that weight. They've burned all those calories off. Um, so it's a very huge migration for a little tiny guy. They're not the furthest traveling though. Uh, there's a type of hummingbird called the Rufus hummingbird that migrates from Mexico up to Alaska. They travel more than 3,000 miles. Uh, of course, they take some time to do that. They don't try to do that in uh, one fell swoop. They'll stop along the way to refuel as they go. Most hummingbirds that migrate migrate at least 500 miles though. So it's a pretty big journey, again, for a little tiny bird. And they make those journeys alone. Hummingbirds are largely solitary and when it's time for breeding they usually become very very territorial. So a male hummingbird tries to impress a female hummingbird with the bright colored feathers. If you've ever seen a hummingbird up close you'll notice that uh, they sometimes have very iridescent almost metallic looking feathers on their head, on their throat, on their back, on their tail, sometimes on their wings. Uh, particularly all hummingbirds kind of have, the males have a very bright patch of feathers right here, just below where their head meets their chest. Um, that area is called a gorget or a throat patch and the iridescent colors that usually show up on those feathers is brilliant. It's estimated that hummingbirds have great vision, better than ours, um, especially their color vision is more highly developed and they can actually see ultraviolet colors. So colors to them are much more vibrant than they are to us. And it's the colors of the males that attract the females to them. Now, occasionally uh, color plays in another part and that's with the flowers that they feed on. They like bright colored flowers and they don't particularly look for a flower that smells good. The uh, smells of flowers typically attract other things like uh, bees. Uh, but flowers that are very bright colored typically attract things like birds, like hummingbirds in particular. After their breeding, the, the female kicks the male out of the territory. She says, you need to go. I need to raise these kids that we're going to have and you're just in the way eating up the resources. You need to hit the road. Uh, so she will chase him off and then she builds the nest by herself. She lays the eggs, she incubates the eggs, she raises the chicks all by herself. She's the ultimate uh, single mother 
and does a really great job. To make the nest, she'll use a variety of different uh, things that she can find, typically moss, small leaves, uh, grasses, sticks, hair, um, but she ties it all together with spider webs. She'll collect spider webs and weave the spider web uh, silks in between all those other materials to hold that together to make it a solid chunk and to attach it to a tree or a branch. Um, if you've ever seen a hummingbird nest up close, you can see that they are very meticulously made. I found one in my yard um, a couple of months ago after it had been very windy. One fell out of uh, some of my trees that are just above me. These trees above me are called bottle brush trees. Um, they're excellent for hummingbirds. They get bright red flowers in the springtime. The branches are also super close together and that's what hummingbirds like when they're building a nest. So I typically have quite a few hummingbirds here uh, in the springtime in my yard. With these spider webs, they weave that nest super tight to the tree and that helps hold it in place. And then she will lay one, usually two, on rare occasions, three eggs. Um, those eggs are tiny. They're like the size of a pea. Um, and she will sit on those for between two to three weeks to incubate them. And then once those hatch, she'll feed her chicks. Um, they grow really quick. Um, typically they are ready to fly in less than a month. Uh, so they grow up really quick. And once they're big enough to regulate their own body temperature, she no longer sits on the nest um, to sleep at night. She'll sleep nearby on another branch so she can still protect her babies, uh, but not take up their space in that little tiny nest. Their nests typically are about the size of a walnut. Um, so super tiny little nest, because uh, they're super tiny little birds. Uh, by about two months, they can be mature and they're off on their own um, and fully able to breed within about a year's time. Most hummingbirds live kind of in that three to five year range um, with some of the bigger species living a bit longer. Uh, some of the bigger ones can live in up to to like 10, maybe 12 years. And there's a couple individuals in like a zoo setting um, that have lived to be 14. Um, that's the record for hummingbird uh, lifespan, uh, which is pretty incredible considering how tiny they are. That's a pretty long time. With hummingbirds, um, they have a lot of different predators. So a lot of things will try to eat hummingbirds. Um, depending on where they live, that's going to be different things. So in the tropics, there's going to be all sorts of things up in the trees that may try to eat them when they're nesting. Things like snakes, uh, bigger lizards, um, some other birds will try to eat them. Here in the U.S., that's one of their biggest predators are other birds, uh, particularly a very small little um, bird of prey called a kestrel. Loves to try to go after small birds like hummingbirds. Um, hawks, owls will both go after hummingbirds. Um, if they're near water, there's some kinds of fish that will try to jump out of the water and eat hummingbirds. Frogs will try to eat hummingbirds. Spiders are capable of catching a hummingbird in their web and eating the hummingbird, especially in the tropics where the spiders are a bit bigger. Um, and there's uh, another insect that really specializes in trying to hunt hummingbirds again more so in the tropics where they're a little more common but there's a type of praying mantis down there that is excellent at catching and eating hummingbirds um, and they can kind of camouflage very well in the bushes and kind of wait as an ambush predator to try to hunt hummingbirds here in north america one of their biggest predators tends to be something that is very close to humans house cats um, house cats kill more uh, little birds in the U.S. than uh, any other source um, that does include hummingbirds. Although they are super fast, if they are not expecting a predator to be nearby, a cat jumping up at a hummingbird near a flower could be quick death to the little tiny bird. Uh, so if you have a cat, try to keep it indoors more often, especially if you have a hummingbird feeder or any bird feeder or flowers that the hummingbirds are coming in to uh, feed off of, keep your cat inside 
it will be better for the birds. With hummingbirds, about 10% of the over 300 species of hummingbirds are threatened with being endangered or vulnerable to extinction. Most of those threatened species live in the tropics of Central and South America, particularly in places where their forest homes are being threatened by agricultural uses. So when we cut down the rainforest to grow crops, especially in the tropics, that's things like bananas, coffee, chocolate, all of those have a toll on the local wildlife and that can uh, definitely be problems for hummingbirds. In the early 1800s and 1900s, when people became very fascinated about hummingbirds and their bright colored feathers, uh, a lot of people were collecting hummingbirds and keeping them stuffed in little boxes in their houses um, and collecting them for their bright feathers. And that actually caused two species of hummingbirds to become extinct. Uh, luckily, people stopped doing that and uh, no hummingbirds are super close to being extinct today, uh, although some of the tropical species are more threatened. Uh, most of the species in the U.S. are actually doing quite well because people who have yards and gardens love to see them around and are doing a pretty good job at either planting flowers that they like or putting out hummingbird feeders uh, that attract the birds and give them some food. So hummingbirds in the U.S. in general are doing quite well. If you want to help out with wild hummingbirds, particularly those uh, in the South America, Central America areas, make sure any products that you buy are um, sustainably grown, especially coffee. Um, coffee can be grown in kind of two major ways. One, they clear all the land, plant just coffee on that land and grow coffee. Um, the other way is called shade grown coffee. So that's where they cut some of the uh, bushes and trees out of a forest. They leave the tall trees. They grow the coffee under the shade of the tall trees and some of the other bushes and plants around. And that provides a home for many of those uh, rainforest habitat and uh, the animals that rely on those big trees or other bushes in the area. So next time you buy coffee, check to see where your coffee comes from. Check and see if you can find out a little more about how it's grown and where it's grown. That can make a big difference. Like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, hummingbirds are very important pollinators. Um, the way that they pollinate, they stick that very long beel into a trumpet shaped flower uh, inside of a flower. Uh, there's a little part that kind of sticks out. You've probably seen this if you've looked at a flower closely uh, that has a little yellow, usually yellow, sometimes orange, sometimes other colors, uh, dusty pollen on it. And as the hummingbird is drinking the nectar, some of that pollen rubs on the hummingbird's head. And then when the hummingbird visits another uh, flower of that same species, that pollen on its head interacts with the part of the flower in the next flower and that pollinates or uh, helps the flower to reproduce that plant. So very important pollinator. Um, bees pollinate in very similar way, although the pollen sticks to the bee's legs. Uh, check out my critter chat on bees if you want to learn more about pollinators and I'll see if I can maybe do a pollinator species tomorrow too. I'm still up for debate as to what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. That's what I have to share with you today about hummingbirds. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I'll be sharing some more video and other information on Facebook, so check that out later today. And as, as always, uh, feel free to like, share, follow, and subscribe to all of my content on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and on my website, jeremythezooner.com, where all of my critter chats and many photos live. So check that out uh, when you have a moment. And until tomorrow, be happy, be healthy, be safe. Stay home, wear a mask. See you tomorrow. Bye.